I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Good evening. Malcolm Honlein, Conference of Presidents, Major American Jewish Organizations, joins me. We have in front of us the breaking news from the White House that the President of the United States authorizes rebel fighting forces in Syria against the Assad regime authorizes the arming of the rebels. Perhaps it's been in the past, perhaps there have been cutouts, perhaps there have been rumors, but now they're authorized in a statement uh, from the White House in these last hours. Also saying that the White House has determined, along with its allies, that chemical weapons have been used in the Civil War. A red line the President and the Secretary of State, Mrs. Clinton, used some time ago confirming that, says the president, that the Assad regime in Damascus has used those chemical weapons. Malcolm, we also have the Iranian selection within these next hours, and we'll learn whether <laughs> your candidate, Mr. Jalili, wins out over the other possible stooges. Uh, the money, the, the bet is still lead. good. Uh, however, we'll get, to, we'll get to Iran soon enough. That's directly linked, of course, to what's happening in Damascus. And the president's statements today, we welcome Daniel Pletka, uh, who is a longtime Senate Committee on Foreign Relations senior professional staff member, testifying recently in Congress about the Syrian civil war, the darkness visible, and now with the, the breaking news, certainly pointing in the direction that Danielle has argued for some time, but I'll let her speak for herself. Danielle, a very good evening to you. The president is arming the free Syrian army, or the Syrian rebels, or those in opposition to the Assad regime, and the president is talking about uh, chemical weapons having been used. Can we now say that the president is saying a red line has been crossed and that the United States is intervening in Syria? Is that too far? Good Good evening to you. Good evening to you too. Well, I, I'm I'm not sure how unequivocal the president ha has been. Certainly, the the White House confirmed this afternoon that uh, that that uh, that what the president termed a red line last August has been crossed. In other words, that the Syrian uh, military and forces associated with Bashar al-Assad had used the chemical weapon sarin, which is ba banned by international convention, and that that had resulted in the death of 150. Uh, approximately 150 civilians. So, uh, d at this point, would you say that there are no good options for the president? Is it too little, too late now? Can he regain credibility about his red line on the use of chemical weapons uh, threat early on? I don't think that I don't think you can ever regain that kind of credibility. What I always think about Syria is, had we acted sooner, had the president had the courage of what were apparently his convictions when he said that Bashar al-Assad had to go, and been willing to intervene on the side of 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 those who wished to oust oust Assad, perhaps we could have avoided the civil war that we see now that's claimed more than ninety thousand and really up to one hundred and twenty thousand lives. Perhaps we could have seen a, a country where al-Qaeda had not been introduced. Perhaps we could have seen uh, a situation in which the Qataris and the Saudis uh, were not involved on the ground arming the wrong guys. This is just, uh, this has been allowed to, to, to spiral into disaster. But how would we uh, determine who we could give aid to? We know that the, the civilian aid that we have is sitting there because we can't determine a group that we could be assured will use it for the right purposes. So if we were to start sending weapons, as one of the options mentioned today, who would they go to? Well, if we were going to start sending weapons, we would be sharing them with the Free Syrian Army. It's my understanding, and again, based on absolutely nothing other than conversations with people who theoretically know, that we are, in fact, on the ground right now. We are helping to direct weapons that are coming from Saudi Arabia, that are coming from others. We're working with Jordanian intelligence a little bit. The point here is, again, I think it's possible for us to identify the right guys, but there are so many weapons on the ground on the hands of so many bad people at this point that even if we start to try to tip the balance in favor of the better guys rather than the worst guys, we're still going to look at an outcome that is a a at best an incredible and long-term mess. Is the Geneva option dead? I think the Geneva option is, is really is dead, and part of the problem there is that Assad believed uh, in the last couple couple of weeks that he'd regained momentum. What we saw was it, Iranian uh, armed forces and Hezbollahis in large numbers fighting alongside Assad's less capable forces, and they have really helped tip the balance for him. He's taken a couple of strategic cities, and so it's really been a disincentive for him to actually take part in Geneva, and the Russians aren't going to lean on him. Danielle, chemical weapons. 
um, my information, and it could be replaced momentarily, is that there was no confirmation of the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. The logic of it suggests, in the incidents that we've pointed to in the past, that the weapons or where the sarin was found or where weapons were used was not a battlefield situation. It was against villagers or civilians. The many of the casualties were civilian casualties. Some of them were troops, but in any event, it was not what on, on ordinarily is considered uh, where, how you would use WMD uh, I between uh, armies or against the Free Syrian Army. So it was a mixed picture at best until this moment. I want to set aside the fact that it's still in doubt. There are assertions by all sides, but not until we get in and test the soil adequately, and nobody's provided the access to that, even to the UN. So therefore, if it is too late for the Obama administration, and I agree with you, if, we, if the Free Syrian Army has already lost the advantages on the battlefields, then why now? It is June. Why is the Obama administration moving? You're correct. They could have moved a year ago, but why now? Well, I think that they're moving now because they recognize that if they don't move, it is very possible that they will end up with a few rump states in what used to be Syria, and the, it, one will potentially be controlled by Alawites and Iranians al allied with Bashar al-Assad, and the other will be controlled by uh, uh, folks who are affiliated and sympathetic to al-Qaeda and other Sunni Islamist extremists. Now, the president may not give a damn about Syria. Certainly, it's been that that's been uh, evident since the beginning. But he does care about the stability of Jordan, the stability of Iraq, Turkey, Israel, and Lebanon. And Syria is bordered by every one of those countries. We've seen spillover in every one. If this goes on much longer, I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that the Hashemite king in Jordan, who was a very important ally to the U.S., could fall. That's something the president doesn't. I, want I to agree happen. with you, and also yeah. Lebanon and Beirut is at di at risk, and uh, the the Turkish border certainly in turmoil, and the whole region could be pulled into this. But again, and I'm I, and I follow your argument. It's too late, Danielle. He's moving when these things are already happening. It's not could fall. It's that the king in Amman, I'm told again and mm -hmm. again, the king in Amman is fragile to the point that it's over there. There's nothing to fight for. Well, you know, I, I guess I disagree with a few of your premises. First of all, I disagree with the suggestion that if we have any doubt about the use of these chemical weapons. It's important to understand Assad's strategy. First of all, the chemical weapons couldn't have been used by the rebels. They were dispersed from the air. The rebels have no air assets, so that's not even in question. And by the way, no one has suggested that that is the case. The UN has confirmed it, Great Britain, France, and now the Obama administration confirmed the use of sarin. The Israelis have said so from the beginning. I see no reason to doubt it. Assad's strategy is to punish people who give safe haven to the rebels. So what he does is he doesn't just attack the rebel forces, he attacks the villages in which the rebels can be found or where they may travel in order to disincentivize uh, giving them safe haven. It's, I, I, Jack Keane and I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal and we called this a reverse counterinsurgency strategy. It's basically all about taking security away from the people in order to stop the rebels' advance. How, how could they have, though, a no-fly zone as one of the options? Would this not lead now to a real Russian-U.S. Uh, direct confrontation? It, it, anybody who thinks that the Russians are going to get into a confrontation with the United States over Syria doesn't understand Vladimir Putin. He's been pushing on an open door up to now. He has been experimenting, pushing the envelope, and he's basically gotten no pushback right. whatsoever from John Kerry and Barack Obama. Once he gets that pushback, once he senses it, he is absolutely going to back down. The idea that they're going to confront us over the port of Tartus and Bashar al-Assad is... is, is it's silly, honestly. No, but the question is really, is it too late, though, because we've let them go so far with the ships, with everything else, that, that a no-fly zone right now might not be a viable option. I, I, I hope you're wrong, uh, but I, I, I agree that this is, this is going to be very little, very late. The real question is that we can't restore the status quo ante. Can we tip the balance back in favor of a better process? I hope we can, but I... I I wouldn't make any bets, and I wouldn't make any promises. Danielle Pletka is the uh, Vice President for Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at AEI, Malcolm Holmline of the Conference of Presidents, Major American Jewish Organizations. I'm John Batchelor. <laughs>